we're going through uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And let me guys ask you a question. How many of you enjoy being anxious? Just love it. I mean, I love being, how many just love panic attacks? They're the best, right? How many like being anxious? No one, right? You like being anxious? Yankees. Are you a Yankee fan? Are you a Yankee fan? Well, the Yankees beat the Red Sox last night. I'm going to remind you of that. Okay, let me enunciate a little clearer. How many of you love the Yankees? <laughs> they need a little help right now. They've been kind of on a, almost hitting below 500 here. Anyhow, that's beside the point. But I don't like anxiety. I hate anxiety. And just this past, uh, about a week ago, we ran into some dear friends of ours. And uh, my family and I, we had a situation where there was, uh, I don't know, let's just say there was an accident. I'm not going to go any more, farther than that. And the person has the audacity to say, you know, you should really be careful. Really? <laughs> Who died and made you Albert Einstein, right? <laughs> I mean, how about this? You, you, you know, you, you trip on the curb and someone goes, watch your step. It's like, thank you so much. Well, sometimes when people say to you, don't be anxious, don't worry. Don't be anxious. And unfortunately, Jesus says three times in this passage, do not be anxious. Do not worry. Do not be anxious. Three times. And when he says it in this passage of Scripture, it's a command. So great. I come to, now I'm more anxious than I'm anxious. Right? Because now I have to stop being anxious because the Bible says it's sin. So I'm a horrible Christian. I'm a lousy person. So why should I even go to church for? And unfortunately, I will tell you that the church in some ways have been horrible about people who struggle with, with emotional issues or mental health. The church sometimes has been the last to get it right. But Jesus was the first to get it right. Amen. Right, amen. So I'm not here to beat you up. 18.1%. 18.1% of the population right now is under some sort of anxiety medication. That's like 40 million people in this country, over 40 million people in this country are on anxiety medication. Now, are we against medication? Well, are you against diabetes? Diabetics having insulin. Okay? So what I'm about to share with you today is going to work. If you're a diabetic and you're 100 pounds overweight and you have Twinkies three times a day, how many folks know if you put the Twinkies away and have granola bars without sugar and you lose some weight, you might get rid of your diabetes or you may still have diabetes and be 85 pounds wet, but you still might need injections every day. But if you change your diet and all that, you might help the situation. Well, the same happens with there are people out there that struggle. Do we judge people that have diabetes? Do we judge people that have heart? Now, listen, if you're having a, you're going to Ruth Chris Steakhouse three times a week, but you know what I'm saying, okay? And sometimes the church, I'm a bad Christian because I have anxiety. I'm a bad Christian because I have compulsive thought. No, you're not a bad Christian. You're called a human being living in a fallen world. And so church, we don't need to put more stuff upon. Let me give you another example. Uh, I grew up in a, in a German and Italian home, and sometimes you go to someone's house, and it's Thanksgiving, okay? It's, they have a beautiful spread. The family's there. The dog and cat are behaving. It's just fantastic. Everything is phenomenal. The waft of the turkey in the air and the lasagna and the sausages and peppers for all the Italians out there and, uh, and the sauerbraten for the Germans. Everything's right there. It's awesome. <laughs> and, and, and you have a stomach virus and you're dry heaving. So someone goes upstairs and get down here. Look at this beautiful food. What's the matter? Sit down and eat some. Uh, would you do that to somebody? No. There are people emotionally that feel like they have a stomach virus. And we're all sitting down at the table of joy and contentment, and we're asking them to eat. What's wrong with you? That's like one of the worst things you can do. You know what the Bible says sometimes? According to Bucci 318? <laughs> sometimes the best thing you can do is shut up. Yeah. I'm just going to say it. Some, the Bible says weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice. Sometimes the best thing you can do is to say nothing and just be around somebody. And sometimes, it happens to me too, I get nervous, I start talking. The best thing to do, by the way, when you get nervous, is say nothing. They'll think you're smart until you open your mouth. That's what you got to do. Just say nothing and just be around that person. So this is not a sermon to kick people down and say that you're a horrible Christian. Okay? God can heal mental illness. Sometimes he uses to heal it through medical science, 
through behavior, then all of it together. And we believe that God heals. You're not a bad Christian if you're on medication for anything, including mental health. Can I hear an oh, no? Amen, right? Come on. So here at Cornerstone Church, we are a non-judging zone for those that are struggling with their mental health. However, we can do things to make ourselves better, just like those with heart disease, just like those who are diabetics. Is that, is that clear? Okay, I want to make that very clear because uh, i never forget when I was going through a hard time in my early 20s. They said, just praise the Lord. Just, pray, just, put a, just put a praise tape. A praise tape. You don't know what those are. Just put a praise tape on. It's going to be okay. And when I couldn't snap out of her for like over three weeks and I was hoping a bus would hit me, uh, I wasn't suicidal, but it, I was a Christian person that, boy, if you want to take me home, go right ahead. For the first time in my life, I couldn't snap out of it. And then all of a sudden, all that cute stuff I used to tell people meant nothing. You know, it, in the past, I'd go for an ice cream cone or go for a run around the block, see a movie, snap out of it. But when you can't snap out of it for two or three weeks at a time, and you just feel like you're going to die, and you're drowning, and you're trying to breathe, and you can't get air in you, listen, it's not fun. So listen, everybody, be compassionate to those that are struggling. Okay, but there is an answer, and Jesus gives us the answer. So we're in the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to tell you guys today not to worry, not stop worrying, okay? And, and, and Jesus actually says it three times. I want to show you what not to do to somebody when they're struggling. Go ahead and show that clip. Let, let me uh, tell you a, a bit about our, our billing. I, um, I charge $5 for the, for the first five minutes, and, and then absolutely nothing after that. How, how, how does that sound? <laughs> That sounds great. <laughs> Too good to be true, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, I can, I can almost guarantee you that, that our session won't last the full, uh, the full five minutes. Now, um, <laughs> we don't do any insurance billing, so you would either have to pay in, in cash or by check. <clears throat> wow, okay. And, uh, and I, I don't make change. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and go. <clears throat> I have this fear of being buried alive in a box. <laughs> I just, I start thinking about being buried alive and I begin to panic. All right, well, uh, let's go, Catherine. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Well, shall I uh, write them down? Well, it, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most We find most people can, uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. You ready? Yes. Okay, here, here they are. Stop it! <laughs> I'm sorry? Stop it! Stop it? Yes, S-T-O-P, new word, I-T. <laughs> so, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I cannot tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. <laughs> stop it. So I should just stop it. There you go. All right. Well, what other uh, problems would you, would you like to address? <laughs> well, I have self-destructive relationships with men. Stop it. <laughs> I don't like this. I don't like this therapy at all. You're just telling me to stop it. And, and, you, and you, don't, you don't like that? No, I don't. All right. Well, that's when comedy was comedy. Any, by the way, Bob Newhart's awesome. But anyhow, but that's an illustration of what can happen to people. And people say this. And by the way, this passage of Scripture can be that way too. Be anxious for nothing. I mean, the Bible talks about that. Jesus says, don't worry. Stop, and, and, and that's what he says, stop worrying. It's a command. But today I want to show you, I want to get this in you today, okay? Here we go. Stop worrying, you are royalty. Can you guys say that together? Stop worrying, you are royalty. Now look at your neighbor and say, stop worrying. Oh, come on, everybody. You can do better than that. Come on, let's do it together here. Stop worrying, you are royalty. It's like herding sheep. Or herding cats. Okay, here we go. One more time. Stop worrying. You are royalty. This is what I want to get into our heads, and my head included. This is the key to getting free of anxiety. But Jesus says in a command fashion, which we'll see in a few moments, this is what he says. 
He says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious. That's a command. Not a suggestion. It's a command. And the word, and by the way, the, the, the verb tense there is you are already anxious. It is just stop doing what you're doing. Okay, like Bob Newhart, but not quite. Okay, therefore, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, here he goes again, can add a single hour to his span. Actually, it shows you he takes life off yourself. And why are you anxious about clothing? Obviously, I'm not. Consider the lilies of the field. Now they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, there he goes again, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, those are non-believing people at the time, seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. So today we're going to talk about how we make this true. And this is from the Sermon on the Mount, which is found in Matthew 5 to 7. We've been going through this line by line, verse by verse, and today we're continuing with it again. And so we come to the end of this, and this is something I want to tell you, I want to encourage you to memorize this verse because it will help you. It's perhaps one of the most important North Star verses you have. If you're a, if you're a captain at sea and if you are a pilot at sea and of a boat or a vessel, you need to know what the North Star is. This is the North Star. But seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient is the day of its own trouble. A lot of anxiety in these verses, right? Well, how do we deal with this anxiety? How do we get victory over it? Okay, Jesus is telling us how to do it. All right, and so we're going to look at it today. Well, first of all, we need to ask ourselves the question, what is anxiety? I think most of us feel it, but it's hard to describe, isn't it? Well, Mr. Webster tried, and I'm going to give him a shot. It's a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. A lot of times anxiety is that fight or flight. Uh, you know, it happens when you're in an airplane and all of a sudden there's a pocket and you, whoo, and you kind of go down and you're like, oh my goodness. And your heart flutters and you have this adrenaline pump through you. Yeah, that's what anxiety is. But sometimes people can't shut it off. And it's, it's a perpetual, da -da -da -da. remember Jaws? I'm dating myself here. Okay? You constantly hear the Jaws soundtrack in, the, in your ears and, and you get anxious. And so well, how do we get free of that anxiety? What are we supposed to do about that? Well, here's, here's something that's true. Anxiety is the will to control the uncontrollable. That's where anxiety comes from. Let's be honest here. If you have complete control over your health, you can control how long you'd live. I'm going to live 1,000 years. If you had, you can control how much money you want, anything you want, any car you want to drive, if you could eat all you want and not gain weight, wouldn't that be great? Okay? Imagine that. You can eat everything you want, to, and you have complete control over everything. You have control over your kids. Can I hear an amen? Amen. They all behaved and got scholarships, free rides. Okay? Thanks so much. Okay? And imagine that. Seriously. If you could control everything. And as a matter of fact, you could control who's in the White House. Okay? Uh, you can control your pastor that he would do short sermons. Okay? Amen. Amen. Oh, stop it. Stop it. If you could control everything, there'd be no anxiety. Would there be? No. So anxiety is the will to control the uncontrollable. So how do we handle that? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I like it. Corey Tan Boone said, such an amazing woman. She said this, Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It empties today of its strength. Boy, is that true. Yes. Worrying about stuff that you can't even control at this point. So what is anxiety? Trying to control the uncontrollable. Where does anxiety come from? 
obviously the devil, right? But also it does this. This is the issue. Where does it come from? We want the power that God has, and anxiety comes from that. We want to be God. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not God. Look, tell your neighbor, neither are you, punk. <laughs> no fighting here, okay? So the issue is we want to be God. I want to control everything, and you're not. You don't know everything, by the way. I used to think I knew everything when I was 20, okay? I know nothing now that I'm 54. Yeah, I'm not that, yeah, I'm not that, I'm that old. But I look great, thanks to the Botox. Okay, let's move on. We want to be in control because we are made to be royalty. What is that supposed to mean? Well, this is the issue. Before sin entered the planet, man and women had dominion over the planet. Adam named the animals. He was basically, some scholars would say, and I agree, he was part of the creative process. God would bring the animals to him, and he would name them, which name is giving character. So God has called us to be rulers. He's called you to be a king and a queen. That's what he's called us to do. And it's, it's a good desire. However, he is the chief. For example, a steward was a slave toward the master, right? But toward everyone else, he was a king. So I'm a steward to God, and now I can walk and be a master to everybody else because God's put me in charge, but I'm submitted to him. Adam and Eve said, uh-uh, ain't going to do that. I want to be wise like God, knowing the difference between evil and good, and I'm going to choose what I think is evil and good. And this is happening in our culture today. Well, I feel it's this. And, and we change the laws of the land. We change everything. I feel this. Imagine getting pulled by a police officer. You're going 120 and 45. And you go, well, sir, I feel that 120 is where I should be driving. And you're being very judgmental to tell me not to. Shame on you. I mean, would you do that? But we do that with God, right? So you're not God. But we've been, you are royalty. Okay? Don't worry, you're royalty. Why? God wants you to be kings and queens submitted to him. All right, and this is what we want to be able to do. So I like what Tim Keller said. He says what he said. He says, our basic essential nature as kings and queens, which we are trying to express by being masters of our own lives when we're not. That's the problem you and I have. That's the issue of anxiety. I can't control the uncontrollable. That's why you guys like dogs. They listen to you. Cats cause anxiety, but we love them. Okay? This is what Jesus says. No, this is what we learned last week. No one can serve two masters, right? For either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, or the word used there in the Aramaic is mammon, which is you can't, basically is you want to control everything. You can't serve God and control everything the way you want to. That's what he's saying. Money gives you options, if you haven't noticed. And the reason why some of us don't have money, because God knows you wouldn't be able to handle it, probably wouldn't I. Okay? So this is what's very important we understand. We cannot serve God in money. So God has to be number one if he's not. And this is the truth. The more you have, the more you worry. It's true. The more, the more power you have, the more things you can lose. And, and the more you gain, it's like an insatiable appetite. It's like a heroin addict that no matter how much they fix themselves with heroin, they can't get high anymore, but they have withdrawal. They need more and more. And this is what happens with this. Control. You want to be your own God, and so do I. And that's what causes the anxiety. We have to take ownership of that. So Jesus is a master surgeon, and he wants to help us to eradicate this vice, this cancer from our body Okay, and so what he goes on to say is this, you cannot serve God and money. Back to Mark chapter 4, 19, Jesus talks about different types of soil and how sowers go out and how some grow fast, some grow slow, some die, and some flourish. Well, look what he says here. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter and what? Choke. You know what happens when you're choked? You can't breathe. One of the key components of anxiety to overcome it is learning breathing exercises. They'll say, stop, breathe in, 
Okay, I breathe out. And that, actually, actually, they do that so you can breathe. Why do they do that for? Because anxiety chokes you. What's the first thing that God did in the garden? He breathed into man and they became alive. The enemy wants to take your breath away. And God wants to give you his breath. How do you do that? Okay, so how do we do that? We don't let these desires and the cares of the world. And the world, it proves unfruitful. So what happens is you run after the Joneses, what everyone else has. You want to control of your family. You can't control your family. You can barely control yourself. Let alone anyone else for that matter. And so we, we, had this, we had this fictitious thing in our mind and we think we're under control. You have Even an atheist who shakes his fist at God is kind of ironic. Why is he shaking his fist at God or her fist at God when there's no God? I heard one time someone said to me, an atheist said to me one time to me, I thank God. I thank God I don't believe in God. <laughs> it's like, okay. It's like saying... What do you add to powdered water? Uh, you know, it's just like one of those things that makes no sense. You'll get that tomorrow. Okay. What is anxiety? Trying to control the uncontrollable. Where does anxiety come from? You want to be king and you can't be king. What do we do about it? Well, listen, everybody, I'm preaching to myself. It's very interesting here. I was feeling fine, but as I was preparing for this. Guess what I experienced the last couple of weeks? Anxiety. Two o'clock in the morning, I hear a motorcycle or something like that. I wake up. There comes the mind, chick, 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 worrying about a couple things that has, has transpired that I wasn't aware of. Some things came to light that I wasn't aware of, and it's been keeping the, the motor running, right? The midnight oil burning. And, uh, and so well, well, I'm going to preach about anxiety, and I'm anxious, okay? And so uh, what do you do with that? Well, this is everybody. This is what we experience. What is anxiety trying to control the uncontrollable? Where does anxiety come from, and what do we do about it? Well, here, I'm so glad you asked. How, what do we do about it? Change from wrong thinking. But before we go there for a second, I think in some ways, some people could use a little anxiety. Oh man, don't worry about it. It's all gonna be taken care of, bro. <laughs> chill, I'm chill, I'm chill, I'm chill, I'm chill, I'm chill. It's everything, hey. Well, I'm chill, man, I'm chill. It's me I got a medical card, bro. You have a job? I'm just waiting on God. I'm just waiting. God will get, God's my provider. Are you going to work? Oh, it's, it's going to be okay. Listen, the last couple of years, I've been getting checks from the government. I had a Biden Disney trip. It was fantastic. I can, and so we sit there, and, and the people get lazy. The Bible says in Thessalonians, if you don't work, you don't eat. So this is not for being lax. Come on, all two of you. This is not being lazy. Change the ray from wrong thinking. Well, what is this all about? Well, know the providence of God and know the love of God. The providence of God, God will take care of it. Now, look at this here. Okay, look at the birds of the air. We have birds in our house. Not in our house, but they try to get in our house. We had this thing called a woodpecker. You know what I want this? <laughs> you remember that one? Okay. I'm sitting there and I hear this. I'm like, what is that? The police? <laughs> I go outside, there's this little bird with a red head going like this. I'm scaring it away. 20 minutes later, I'm like, how is this bird making noise on a vinyl siding? How? And so the bird, and we had birds that are trying to make nests, and they're very aggressive. We had a little reef on our door. And so we took the nest down. The next day, they have another nest, and they would go on. Now, what does this say right here? Check it out. Check it out. It says this. Look at the birds of the air. They sit in their parents' basement smoking pot. Is that what it says? Is that what it says? No. Look at the birds of the air. They neither snow or reap or gather in barns, but they're busy. The early bird gets the... Okay. So we're not talking about inactivity. What we're talking about is knowing that God's got control. And I love hearing the birds sing in the morning. They sound so happy, right? Remember that old song? His eyes are on the sparrow. And I know he's watching me. Right? A beautiful. God's got his eyes on you. You're more important than a bird. I told that to PETA. Okay? You're more important than animals. You're the creation. Uh, you're the cream of God's crop. We're the pinnacle of his creative order on this planet. You're more important than the salamanders. You're more important than worms. Can I hear an Amen. 
Amen. Some of you need to treat your spouse better than that, okay? So look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than this? This is a rabbinic tradition, a device used where you take the lesser to show the greater. And here's Jesus doing a good teaching method here, okay? So what do you do about it? Change from wrong thinking, know the providence of God, and know the love of God. And which of you, by being anxious, can end a single hour to the span of life? You know what I heard from Mayo? That's the creator of mayonnaise. No, Mayo, the Mayo Clinic, did a study, and they found out that we, something we know for a long time. That anxiety actually gives you hypertension, can cause ulcers, can actually shorten the span of your life. So Jesus says, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? You know, it's really sad uh, today, uh, especially among teenage girls and teenage boys, but especially like teenage girls, they're sitting on here all the day long, and they're seeing all these other girls wearing these clothes, and they're so skinny, and they have, they have six packs and whatever they have. They're wearing all these clothes. They look at their clothes. They're anxious about it. How am I supposed to go to school this way? Or what I heard a, a young lady say, really sad, she says, I'm really concerned because now we don't have to wear a mask in school, so now they can see my face. Can you imagine that? Being bullied? Parents, listen. These things are great tools, but, man, they can screw up people Big time. And you do it too. You keep getting jealous of all the vacations out there. How could they go there? What, how much does he make? Okay? And we sit there, we look at it, and then sometimes they got anorexic feelings. They get bulimia feeling. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not good enough. I don't do enough. I don't have this. And pastors do it too. I don't have a church like that. You know? And you look at this thing, and what happens is you get worried about it. And why are you anxious about clothing, what you're going to wear, Right? Uh, consider the lilies of the field, the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor they spin. But you know what happens in your work? You get nervous. You go like this, and you start spinning. And the more, you, oh my goodness, the more you spin, <laughs> the more you spin, you can't walk straight anymore. And that's why we're spinning and worry. And boy, I, I'm not going to do that next service. So <laughs> put the, send that to the district office. I think I'm drunk. But seriously, you start spinning around. You keep on spinning. You don't need to be spinning. Let God do the spinning. Let God take care of it. You see, consider the lilies of the field. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Neither toil nor they spin, right? Yet I tell you, even Solomon, now he's giving a dig at Solomon, the greatest and the wealthiest king that ever was. He said, Solomon, he ain't getting nothing on this. He can't touch this, okay? Even Solomon, all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But God is so close, the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. Will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? I don't think any of us have trouble with that in the United States of America, at least in our, in our, in our community right here. What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles, these are non-believers at the time, seek. And the word seek, you know what the word seek is there? The word seek is, it's your first day on the job, and you can't find your keys to drive to work. And if you don't show up, you're going to get fired. How? Before you, first you blame everyone on the house. But before you do that, how hard are you going to look for those keys? You're seeking. That's the kind of thing. For the Gentiles, seek after these things. And your heavenly Father what? He knows that you need them all the time. I love growing up. When I was growing up, I, I had no idea what would happen. I wake up in the morning, there's be breakfast. It's fantastic. And I, everything I needed, I just, just went to sleep, woke up, it was there. You know, and, and that's how it is when you're a kid. You don't have no idea how, how great you have it as a kid until you have to start paying mortgages and putting kids through college. And I'm sorry. All right. George Mueller, 1800s, great guy, had orphanages, and you want to read a great story, read about him. It's, a, it's public access now, his book, his memos. One of the things he says is this. The beginning of anxiety is the end of faith, and the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. Now, if you're struggling with mental health issues and there's some physiological problem, that's still 
gets better. Okay, I just want to make that clear. All right? So this is what begins, and God can heal you. Okay? But what does the Bible say? But seek first what? Kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. Don't seek first being liked. Don't seek first looking for a job. Oh, that's important. Seek first the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? How do we begin the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, hallowed be thy name. My kingdom come. My will be done. Because you're in heaven, you're going to bless me as I tithe to your ministry. Even though it's partially true. Anyhow, <laughs> no, seriously. Seriously. Is that, that's what we hear sometimes on television and stuff, right? No. What does he say? Your kingdom come. Your will be done. So what are we asking for? We're seeking God's kingdom. We're going after God. And so we talk about the eyes. Whatever's before your eyes fills you. So if i am got the kingdom of heaven, I'm caring about the kingdom of heaven. I'm not caring too much. God, these are the children you sent me. God, this is the church you gave me. It's not my responsibility completely. You're the one that put me here. You're going to provide what I need. Thank you, Jesus. Rather than it's all about me, a poor me. And then the violins start playing. No, that's not what we're talking about. But seek first the kingdom of God, and his what? Righteousness. Doing the right things. The ends does not justify the means. Not reporting that income and not paying taxes is not the right way to help God. Well, I'm going to give more to the Lord. Yeah, sure. Seriously. We got to do, render to Caesar's what Caesar's and God's is God's. And you think you got it bad here. You should have been back in the time of Christ. We got to be people of integrity. We got to do the right thing. We got to put an honest day's work in. Don't be the first, last one there and the first one out. We should be the best. The best. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to do this because I, I, I can. Um, I'm going to put them on the spot because I love them. Tom and Heidi Buckin, they're in the back there. Say hi, Tom and Heidi Buckin. Pastor Tom and Heidi Buckin. <laughs> Pastor Tom, if I get the story correct, you can ask him afterwards, was out of a job when he was like 42 years old. And he was an art director and all that. And so what is he doing? He's digging ditches. Literally digging ditches. And he's working his, his, you know, his proverbial blessed assurance off. Okay? He's working hard. And a guy comes out, that, oh, the owner of the home, starts talking to him. They have to strike up a conversation. So, and he finds out he's an art person. So guess what he does? A ditch digger becomes the chief, right? Art director of a company. Okay? He's there for 18 years or 17 years. 17 years, you know what the guy does at the end? He pays all of his college debts for his kids off so he can go into the ministry. Wow. Well, I'm an art director. I don't dig ditches. I'm going to wait here until I... Please, don't be a loser. Be a worker. Work hard for God. Work hard for God. You need to hear that, everybody. Work hard for God. Do the best. Whatever God calls you, if you're scrubbing a toilet bowl, scrub it to the glory of God. If you're sweeping, do it to the glory of God. If you're at Starbucks, please hurry up and be quicker with the drinks. <laughs> Holy mackerel. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get that out. Yeah. I'm getting anxious about it. Where was I? I don't know. Here I am. But anyhow, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, okay? And so this is, here, this is the real issue. You ready? You're not going to like this. See, our problem is we want Jesus' blessings, but we don't want King Jesus. I'm sorry. It's true. We're selling a false gospel. Come to Jesus. You've got a better house a better car, you'll, you'll meet your wife, you get rid of your anxiety. All those things are true, by the way, partially. You're going to be wealthy, you're going to be happy, don't know what to do with your life, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. He'll give you everything you need. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. But I'm going to sleep with my girlfriend even though we're not married yet. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. But I'm going to give in to my proclivities. I can't help myself. When you're hungry, you eat. When you want sex, you have sex. God understands. He'll forgive me. I love Jesus, but he's not king. Guess what? You're not a Christian. You're, you are following a philosophy that you like. And I hate to say it, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised. There's a number of you here today that are not even believers. And those watching online. Maybe not you, but the next, the next service probably. But seriously. 
Uh, just because you like Jesus and you believe in Jesus, great. The book of James says, so does the enemy. Salvation's free, but it costs God everything. And there's only one way it works. He's got to be king of all or he's king of none. Now, I made a decision to follow Jesus. Do I still struggle with that decision? Yes. I continually want to take control again. And every, all my anxiety comes from that, by the way. Okay? So, see, our problem is we want Jesus' blessings, but we do not want King Jesus. Do you want King Jesus today? Yes. I can't promise you a pain-free life. Jesus never promised us that. Imagine having a book title. Instead of your best life now, in this world you'll have trouble. How'd you like that as a book title? I'm just saying. I'm not speaking against anybody, but I'm just saying. In this world you'll have trouble. How many will that sell? Will I be booked on Oprah for writing that book? It's impossible that an offense shall not come. Jesus does not promise us a perfect life, but he promises a perfect eternity. Life does not make sense without an eternal mindset. So I want to encourage you with that as we conclude. There's more I could share, but I think we need to land the plane here. So let me ask you a question. Are you trusting Jesus right now? I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads. And how many of you would say this? I'm a believer, but I've never given my life to Jesus completely, and I want to today. Show of hands. I'm a believer but I've never given my life completely to Jesus. How's that possible? The devil's a believer. I'll have no one else but him. Maybe you used to walk with God and you're not walking with him anymore. Today is a day of salvation. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a prayer. It's not the prayer. It's your heart connected to the truth of what God did for you. How many would say, I've never completely given my life to Christ, but today I want to? Or... I used to walk right, but the world, the choke, the things of this world has choked it out of me. I want to get back right with God. I see a quick show of hands for those two categories. Okay. Let's pray this prayer from our hearts. In your heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And today... I choose to make you King Jesus. Take my life. It is yours. In Jesus' name, I give my life to you. Thank you. Based upon what you did on the cross, in my belief in my heart and confession with my mouth, I thank you. I am now a child of you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Jesus never told the disciples, oh, we got another one. Put up the check mark. So, yeah, you prayed the prayer, and that's phenomenal. But Jesus says something. He says, come, follow me. Are you following Jesus? We are a community of people. that We're not perfect. It's not a perfect church. I'm not a perfect pastor. But our objective is that you would know God, and you would follow him, and that we would help each other along that way. And so we are a community of people that love God, are growing in him. We want to be used by God to transform our communities by helping each other be the men and women of God we're called to be. And so that's what we're all about here. I want to encourage you with that, okay? And I just want to conclude with this because I, I think I just want to get that first. And also, if you say that prayer today, there's a card in the back pocket of your seat. You want to pull that out. And you mark on there, my decision today. Or you can also text BELIEVE to 860-499-4888. That's 860-499-4888. And we'll help you with the next steps of your time. Now for the rest of us that struggle with anxiety like me, as a boxing match sometimes. Sometimes I win. Sometimes I come out the black eye. Sometimes I have to ask my friends, you know what, I need some help here. I'm battling this anxiety. And, and by the way, it's okay. The Apostle Paul had anxiety. He says, not only that, I got the anxiety of the churches. So it's okay, but we can't let it take control of us. You see, Jesus says this, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient is the day of its own trouble. My friends, we have to live one day at a time. That's it. We can't live tomorrow. We can't live tomorrow. 
I like what George McDonald said. He says, no man ever sank under the burden of one day. It's when tomorrow's burden is added to the burden of today. That weight is more than a man can bear. God gives us enough for today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Take care of today. That's what the 12 steps say. Don't worry about not drinking tomorrow. Don't drink today. And maybe you have to cut that days in half. I'm not going to drink before 12. I'm not going to drink after 12, right? I'm not going to worry. And this is part of what we have to do. See, this is what you and I need to do. You will keep in perfect peace all who what? Trust you. All whose thoughts are not watching Netflix for eight hours. All, all whose thoughts are not scrolling through Instagram or TikTok. All those whose thoughts are f what? Fixed. What does fixed mean? It means fixed. Thank you. Fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always. For the Lord God is the what? Eternal rock. The United States will come and go. Rome came and went. Greece came and went. Okay, Babylonian Empire came and went. But the kingdom of God is forever. We stand on the eternal rock of Jesus Christ. He's more than enough. So, I'll come back where we started. Stop worrying your royalty in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's, uh, let's give an opportunity right now to give back to the Lord. There's no, you know, how do you get to? The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And so I want to encourage you to seek God first in everything, including your giving. And so you're, there are places to give that you can pull out your envelope in the back. You can go the four different ways. You can get your phone and QR code. Again, you don't have to. You get to, okay? Uh, CornerstoneCheshire.com. You see the ways how to do it, okay? Can we all, um, can we all stand? And at our end of our time here today, please put those connection cards if you who gave life to Christ in those boxes. And we'll have a prayer team up here to pray with you. We'll go to the front desk, put the offering in the back, or do the other things, okay? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Sufficient is the day's evil. I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you, even unto the end of the age. Amen. Amen.